Welcome to EWTN's series, Advent Reflections. My name is Father Patrick McCafferty. I'm pastor of Corpus Christi Parish here in Belfast, and I'm speaking to you today from our diocesan cathedral, St. Peter's Cathedral in the city of Belfast, the seat of the Bishop of the Diocese of Down and Connor. So dear sisters and brothers, let's begin our reflection looking at the scriptures of this the fourth Sunday of Advent. We're here on the threshold of Christmas. The fourth Sunday of Advent this year coincides with Christmas Eve, and we are being invited to pause amidst our many busy pre-Christmas Day activities to savor the beauty of what God is unfolding once again, to reflect upon his word to us on this threshold of the feast of the birth of his beloved son. In that well-known, well-loved Christmas carol, written by the Reverend Philip Brooks from Philadelphia in the United States, which sings about the little town of Bethlehem lying so peaceful and still on the night of the Lord's birth, we have this line, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. In today's liturgy of the fourth Sunday of Advent, the first reading from the second book of Samuel, the Psalm, Psalm 88, and the short portion of chapter 16 of St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the second reading, encapsulates beautifully these hopes and fears of all the years. King David, David, whose very name means beloved, finally has peace after all his battles. At last, he has respite after all his campaigns, his many dangers and sufferings. So he turns his mind to building God a house. He says to the prophet Nathan, it's not right for me to live in this beautiful house of cedar while the ark of the Lord lives in a tent. The ark, remember, was the actual location for the people of God of the glory and the mercy of God among his people. It is a good and loving thought that David has, but God has a different plan, a much more excellent plan, which will benefit not just King David and his subjects and the people of that particular time, but all of humanity of every time and every place. God effectively says to David, are you the one to build me a house? No, David, I will build you a house. In the house that the Lord will build for David, all of us will find our place as beloved daughters and sons of God. God who delights in being close to us, whose name is Emmanuel. God is with us. He says to David through the prophet, I will provide a place for my people. I will protect them there and keep them safe. I will give them rest. I, the Lord, will make you great, and I will build you a house. How important it is for us, dear sisters and brothers, human beings, created in the image and likeness of God, and with the echo of eternity in our hearts, to have 
a place, a place that is permanent and secure. Insecurity and instability cause so much stress and anxiety to our human nature. How important it is, for example, that parents provide a safe, secure, and dependable base for their children. God did not create us to be cast to the mercy of the elements, to leave us a prey to chance. God's promises to us are definite, and they are absolutely trustworthy. I will build you a house. Now, of course, this house built by the Lord for us is no temporary or temporal structure. It is rather the destination described by St. Paul in the second letter to the Corinthians, where he says, after the tent that we live in on earth is folded up, there is an everlasting home, not made by human hands, a house built by God for us in the heavens. And it is to this house that the Lord Jesus refers on the eve of his passion to comfort and reassure his disciples, where he says to them, I am going now to prepare a place for you. And after I have gone and prepared you a place, I shall return to take you with me, so that where I am, you also may be. This, dear sisters and brothers, is that indestructibly safe home where the Lord's truth is firmly established and where his love is everlasting. Within that spiritual structure, built immovably by God, we will sing forever, as the psalm today puts it, we will sing forever of his love. And throughout all ages, our mouths shall proclaim his truth. There will be no uncertainty there. There will be no insecurity there. Together, we will say to him there, you are my Father, my God, the rock who saves me. Yes, dear friends, there in that safe home, we stand forever built upon the immovable rock singing of his love, proclaiming his truth, his love and his truth revealed to us by his beloved Son. For this house the Lord has promised to build as the place of eternal safety and shelter, the plans of it and its wonderful design is revealed in the advent of Jesus Christ who, as St. Paul declares in the second reading of today's liturgy, Jesus Christ is the revelation of a mystery kept secret for endless ages, but now so clear that it must be broadcast to all the nations to bring them to the obedience of faith. This is all part of the way the eternal God wants things to be. So God has promised us a house where we are kept safe, a house in which we all take our place as beloved, beloved children of God's own. The exact nature of the house, however, is not immediately apparent to King David. He thinks it only has to do with his own security and a guarantee that his lineage shall endure. However, all of this is pointing and looking towards and preparing the way for the one who is called by the poet, great David's greater Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the well-beloved Son 
of the Most High. And so, it is all leading up to the verses we read in today's gospel. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Hello and welcome back to our continuing Advent Reflection. My name is Father Patrick McCafferty, speaking to you from St. Peter's Cathedral, Belfast, in the north of Ireland. Before the break, we were looking at the, the first reading and the psalm and the uh, second reading from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, and we're going to continue now with this reflection. The hopes and fears of all the years God's promise of a Redeemer after the fall of Adam and Eve, God's assurances of his saving help to generation after generation, the pronouncements of the prophets that God would intervene on his people's behalf. At a very dark moment in his people's history, God had sent his prophet Isaiah with a word of hope to people who were on the ground. And that message, that word of hope, the virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, a name which means God is with us. And at long last, after all those centuries of waiting and yearning and hoping, in the sixth month, of her cousin Elizabeth's pregnancy with St. John the Baptist, what God had promised, what he had foretold, comes to pass. A virgin shall conceive, and the name of the virgin is Mary, the most blessed virgin, our mother Mary. Dear sisters and brothers, do you know why her being a virgin, our blessed lady being a virgin, is so central to the mystery of our salvation. Why? Because we mere mortals, men and women, caught in the mess of the sins of the world, we were beyond human help. We could not save ourselves. There was no help for us in any mere mortal. The psalmist says, Human help is vain, but with God we shall do bravely. We needed, you see, the direct intervention of God. And God, seeing our, our plight, seeing our distress, reached down with his own mighty hand and his great arm of strength, and he did something new and won wondrous in the virgin mother of his beloved son. First of all, he preserved her from every trace of sin, from the first moment of her conception. There is no fault in her. There is no stain upon her. She is altogether beautiful. She is the entirely splendid new work of grace. We can say of Mary, who is the glory and the honor and the joy of the people of God, we can say to her, you are entirely beautiful, my beloved, and you are without blemish, as the words of the Song of Songs and the, the bridegroom saying, speaking them to his bride. And we can apply those words to the most blessed virgin. With what love beyond telling can we say that our most blessed mother, the mother of the Lord and our mother, is entirely beautiful and spotless. We can boast to the praise of the glory of the grace of God, of having a spotless 
and perfect mother. God preserved her from every trace of sin and every spot of imperfection. We know very well that God did this for her because he chose her to be the mother of his Son who saves us from our sins. He who is the remedy for sin, our salvation and our deliverance from sin, is born into the world in a spotless and immaculate mother through her womb, nursed in her arms and upon her knee. All of this is that we might be comforted, that we might be comforted and consoled without measure by the drawing near of God himself in his Son. God, in his grace, preserved her immaculate at the moment of her conception. And he would add to that the glory of virginity before, during, and after the birth of his Son. The virginity of our Blessed Lady and the virgin birth of her Son are a declaration that God alone has saved us, no one else. God alone has saved us. No mortal hand was in it. For we were entirely helpless. We had nothing to contribute of our, our any worth because we had messed up on a grand scale. We were beyond human help. We were beyond making things right, but we were not beyond the mighty help of God. Nothing is impossible to God, the angel Gabriel declares to our Blessed Lady when he tells her that her kinswoman Elizabeth has in her old age also conceived a son, and she whom people call barren is now in her sixth month. She whom people called barren. Barren and desolate was the entire landscape of human life and human history. Barren and blighted, hopes dashed, and suffering upon suffering without remission, sorrow upon sorrow. We have heard throughout this season of Advent the cries and the sighs. Remember on the first Sunday of Advent a few weeks ago, the, the scriptures from the prophet Isaiah, Oh, that you would tear the heavens open and come down. We were all like men unclean, all that integrity of ours, like filthy clothing. We have all withered like leaves, and our sins blew us away like the wind. For you hid your face from us, and you gave us up to the power of our sins. And yet, Lord, you are our Father. We the clay, you the potter, we are all the work of your hand. This great cry of distress, of sorrow for sin, of longing for redemption, is heard by God and is completely answered when Gabriel goes in to Mary and says to her, Rejoice, so highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary, the Lord is with you, and through you God draws near to all with his tenderness and with his consolation. No more, barren, no more desolation. The hopes and fears of all the years are met by God's tearing the heavens open and coming down in this child entrusted to Mary, who is to be called Jesus, the great Son of the Most High, to whom the Lord God will give the throne of his ancestor David, whose kingdom will have no end. 
God's promise to David of a secure and everlasting house will now be fulfilled, for Jesus is himself that house. He gathers us all into himself, and he builds us up into himself. He incorporates us into himself, living stones, as Scripture puts it in the letter of St. Peter, making a spiritual house where God lives in the Spirit. But we notice, dear friends, that the Most Blessed Virgin is perturbed and frightened. We're told that. How can this come about, she says, since I am a virgin? And the angel answers her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and so the child will be holy and will be called the Son of God. Mary is clothed with the power of the Most High. The infinite power of the living God descends upon her. The incomprehensible might and strength of God overshadows her, because God is coming to the help of his people. A mighty and invincible champion is coming to do battle with all that militates against our humanity. A stern warrior is coming to take on death and the powers of death and the principalities of darkness and the craft and the power of the devil, the power of the Most High is coming to our defense. But mark what Gabriel says to our Blessed Lady, Mary, do not be afraid. Through the mother of his son, God is addressing all of us who are afraid. With great tenderness and gentleness, Mary is clothed by the power from on high. With what tender respect God approaches her on our behalf. Mary herself, in this encounter, entrusted with this mission, she remains entirely intact. She is in no way overwhelmed by the greatness that comes to her. This, again, is why God saves us by sending his Son born of a virgin. The mighty power of God, when it touches us, it does us no violence. It does not crush or obliterate us. God's power dealing with evil does battle. Yes, God does battle in his full might against evil, but his Son coming to us through Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit is our healer, our physician, who anoints our wounds with great tenderness, who treats us in our sins with infinitely kind mercy. He has said to us in the gospel, it is not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. And so the child born of Mary is meek and humble of heart, and he invites us to come to him. Whoever comes to me, he says in the Gospel of St. John, I will never turn them away. Whoever comes to me, I will never turn them away. We are saved by the loving and merciful Son of a gentle virgin and an immaculate mother. She is clothed with the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Most High, so that the child to whom she gives birth might reclothe us, clothing us once more in our dignity that had been lost. He will carry out this great work of our salvation, our healing, our deliverance in the power of the Holy Spirit, who first overshadowed his mother. 
the same Spirit whom he would breathe forth into the darkest depths of death itself. For after he said, dear sisters and brothers from the cross, behold your mother, he said to his father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, the spirit of the Father and the Son, the spirit of infinite love, love stronger than death, the spirit who descended upon the most blessed virgin is the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, and he is living in us. This spirit of the living God lives in us. May we, dear sisters and brothers, may we have the spirit of faith that the most blessed Virgin Mary, our mother, had, realizing with her that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us up also with Jesus in our turn and bring us to himself and you with us. In the midst of the joys and the sorrows, the successes and the failures, the disappointments and the anxieties, the stresses, the pluses and the negatives of our experiences, there stands Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, the joy of love. He himself is the joy of love, proclaiming to us the truth that we are loved. We have in him a house built by God in which we have eternal security, the joy of being loved for all eternity. Glory be to him. Amen. So, dear friends, thank you for joining us for this series of Advent Reflections from St. Peter's Cathedral in Belfast. On behalf of my brother priests and Father Martin Graham, the administrator of the cathedral, if you're ever visiting us, please come and see this beautiful church, our cathedral church of the Diocese of Down and Connor. And we wish you all a very blessed, peaceful, and joy-filled Christmas. Mm -hmm.